guys, so the, the, now it's time for the one of the biggest stars of Demo Beat, of this year's Demo Beat. Uh, I'd like to welcome Smash. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, listen, I'm, uh, everybody's like, like really big about Dan was like, he nearly pissed his pants. He was <laughs> like, he's going to be here. He's coming over. I'm like, nice. So, and uh, I've seen everybody sends greetings to Fairlight. Everybody's like, like uh, has. Uh, so you've done really um, a lot of things. So what do you do now? Nowadays, I run a company that makes a piece of visual effects software called Notch. Mm -hmm. So it's using uh, all the stuff we learned from making demos come to, to, me, come um, to me. So it's using all the stuff that we learned while making demos, to, but trying to make it accessible to artists. So uh, we, we spoke about uh, uh, other demo, demo creators who created some software to, for, to, to, to make it available for other people. So how do you can it, can it be done that that uh, the code is really clean that the, the the program is small and still it's accessible for the people like uh, I think there needs to be some balance between those two things like it has to be available for everybody some really um, people who cannot program should be able to use it but still the the, the code and what comes outside should be really nice and fast so is that possible to I achieve? think it is yeah I think we've tried really hard to find the balance to mm -hmm. give people the power while also making it accessible it's because we were making demos for a long time where a designer was doing a lot of the work, so we kind of had to go through this over and over again while making the demos. Um, so, and, and uh, you you worked for for a long time with uh, real time productions of big events. Uh, mm. What what were the the biggest things you did? Because I, I couldn't find uh, anything concrete. So so what was the like the biggest? The first thing we ever did was uh, Eurovision in mm -hmm. 2014. And since oh. then, we did... Um, what did you do in Eurovision? Like all the did, visuals? Like no, nah, we did some of the interactive effects. On, they had a LED floor, mm -hmm. which is awful, by the way. But they mm -hmm. uh, had some, like, skaters going around, and we were putting tracking effects on them. And wh which country was this? This was the one in Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen. It's uh, very cold in Copenhagen. Uh, in March, it is. It, at, least, uh, at least everything's expensive, so... Yeah. Well, <laughs> then we, did, we went on to do... Uh, so we did the visuals for Ed Sheeran that mm -hmm. year, and then we've worked with... Like Coldplay, um, Kanye West, Beyonce. Really? Um, and what is what is uh, at these projects like? What is your mission? Like, what is uh, your what do you do there? Because there, there are probably there are some people who bring the screens, and wh where do you come in? So we used to actually do quite a lot of the visual content, but mm -hmm. nowadays, uh, because we've developed the software, we're selling the software. We uh, people buy the tool, and they so we have a load of good users who buy the tool, and they go and make the projects. So they're using the tool to make a lot of the visual content you see on the screen mm -hmm. behind you. And you can, do, you can do anything. You can just prepare the content, uh, and you can also like, divide it between the screens and do like, everything. Or, or we work with other software to do things like dividing between the screens, but we enable you to use, for example, um, like live camera feeds or live audio feeds to that affect really the visual, to be part of the visual. Oh, that is really cool, because the, the productions which, which you do are, are, I think they're so different. Like, like as you mentioned, the floor, uh, sometimes you just do event which is in one place, then you do a tour which you need to move everywhere, where you need to, like, to pack the screens Ooh. and do it differently. Uh, the Notch can do anything from this? or, or it's, it's a content tool, but mm. it's, what it gives you is the ability to, like when you start using the live camera as mm. part of a visual, mm. for example, you realize when you go to a gig that everybody watches the, vis the gig like this, looking at the side screen with mm. the iMac on it. Oh, yeah. And then they're actually doing this with their phone the whole mm -hmm. time. So by enabling people to use the camera image or other like, live performance as part of the visual, it forces the attention to people to look forward. Oh, that is so it, makes a very, it actually makes a, a show that's better and more watchable. Oh, so and and don't you lose your jobs now because uh, you sell the software so they don't call you anymore? You don't and go it's anywhere. It's good. It's good. You know, it's good. You want to sit down and finally want to. I did. I, I did. I went on a tour bus once for like three days, and it was enough. Uh -huh. So I kind of prefer not doing that. Okay, so I'm looking forward to your presentations, ladies and gentlemen. Smash. So um, what I'm officially here to do, to talk about is VR. Uh, so we've been working with VR for the last couple of years and um, in a number of ways. And we've recently had our first proper project released on the Oculus Store. So I want to talk about our experiences in making that and the aftermath of it. And also hopefully try and compel you to make VR demos because they have a lot of potential in my mind. 
If you've seen Gargai's talk earlier today, then just uh, change all the names and you don't need to watch anything else. But if you haven't, then please keep watching. Um, so before we get into VR, I'm going to back up and tell, tell you how we got here. So um, I've been in, uh, in the demo scene for over 20 years. Uh, I think it's about 24 by now. So I'm officially old. And um, I also worked in game development for quite a long time. And the time that I spent working on demos and working in games and working on live events taught me two very important things about real-time graphics. The first thing is that real-time graphics works out a lot better when a designer is involved, when it's not all left to the coder to do all the work. And the other really big learning is that real-time is actually a fantastic workflow. Like, the output doesn't necessarily have to be real-time. The output can be a video, but the workflow of using real-time for creative purposes is amazing. Like, when, you're, when people have been used to working on graphics, when they're using tools like After Effects or Cinema 4D, they've got used to a workflow where they make something, and then eventually, at some point in the future, they are able to see what that thing actually looks like. Whereas people like musicians, for example, they are completely used to a workflow where they press play, and they can hear and edit their track as they listen to it. If, a music, if you told a musician that when he fiddled in a medley, a melody on his piano, and then he was going to have to wait for like five, ten minutes to hear what that sounded like, he'd tell you to fuck off. He would tell you it'd be unbelievable. Uh, but the graphic artists are used to this workflow. And what real time does is it, it completely changes that. And it brings you back into this instant feedback loop that you want to be in when you're creating something. You can constantly edit and play and manipulate what you're working on. So it brings back this immediacy. And we learned that through doing demos and being forced to do real-time creative stuff for all that time. Uh, there are a lot of good designers who can also code. They're very fortunate. And there's also a lot of good coders who happen to be good designers. There are many who are not. There are many coders who are terrible designers, and there are many designers who never want to code. And they shouldn't have to. So for them, we made Notch. And the idea behind Notch was to take everything we learn from, um, from our years as uh, making demos and working in games and everything, and putting it into a package that's usable by designers or artists, that's usable like a tool like After Effects. So you don't need to code to use it. You should be simple, it should be understandable, it should feel natural. And uh, so, as I press play. Um, so here's a little video of Notch, uh, Notch in action at high speed. So this is a piece of content made by our designer, Armin, and he's just using the node-based interface to place copies of a 3D object. And then he's using audio to drive the motion of the objects. He's putting some lights in, uh, setting up the camera. It would look very familiar to someone used to using Cinema or Fusion or After Effects or any of those tools. But everything is happening in real time. And for everyone who's used to working on demos, this is probably not a great surprise. But for people who've never worked on demos or never been involved in real-time graphics, it's quite a fundamental thing. It changes completely the way they're working. Why does Donald do look like a penis? Why what? Why does Donald do look like a penis? It does. <laughs> See, this is the problem. You, you're designing all this stuff made from penises, and you never realize until someone points it out. So this is actually, um, this is actually a real piece of content. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, fixing up post effects and uh, animating a bit more, and he's set up the scene. And it's starting to actually become uh, a decent looking scene. Um, so this is a real piece of content. It was actually used on um, uh, a show for the 90s pop duo Snap uh, a few weeks ago. And this is a shot from the actual stage. You can see there's uh, many happy people and a band on stage and some lights. Everything looks better when you chuck loads of lights in front of it. 
So um, we released Notch back in 2016. And uh, we were lucky that we relatively quickly found success. So the approach we took was rather than try and bring in our own complete solution, which, uh, which throws out everybody else, we went for the approach of trying to integrate with everybody so we could fit into everybody else's workflow. So we integrated with the leading media servers or out there in the industry. And these are the, really the gatekeepers to being able to work on live events because they've already got their equipment sold onto every show, every tour, every TV production. If you're going against them and providing a complete solution, then you have to not only make your solution work, but you have to kick all of those solutions out. And by integrating with everybody and being friends with everybody, we were able to sit in any show in the world. And uh, it was a big hit straight away in the live events industry. The live events industry needs real time because they want to be able to use things like cameras and audio and uh, things that are controlled interactively. Like a lot of musicians don't play to time. They tend to wander and you need to be able to move things around to keep up with them. They also want to use tracking data and they want to use everything, all these real-time inputs. It means that they need a real-time renderer of some kind. So we used on, uh, thankfully, we used on quite a large number of shows now. And we also won the live design product of the year last year. So it's been very successful in live events. So we're now, I think I did some sort of really bad back of the envelope stat and worked out that probably like 10% of the world has probably seen Notch without knowing it. Um, that it's used on everything from the Ed Sheeran tour to the Beyonce tour to the Katy Perry tour to the Grammys to Eurovision, a whole large poster projects over the years. And uh, so it's, it's, it's gone well for us, but now we, we started last year or the year before to look at ways we could bring this to other markets. So the way we could start applying this to uh, the virtual reality market. And uh, also try and bring it out for more than just the live in events industry, try and bring it out for others. So now this brings us on to VR. So VR, um, where are we at the moment with VR? So VR, around three years ago, was a massive hype machine. Um, because VR's been around before, right? It was around in the 90s. It was around again. So it's been around like three times by now. But the difference this time was that there was an enormous amount of money pumped into it and some very large commercial players involved. So we're seeing Facebook, Samsung, Google, HTC, all these big commercial players invest a lot of money this time in making it working. And uh, accompanied by the hype from the, the, the vendors and the hardware platforms was an enormous amount of investment hype. So in, like, there was billions and billions of investment from in Silicon Valley on VR-related startups, projects, and so on. And then, um, then the stuff actually came out. And then the reality hit that maybe it wasn't quite the, like, the, the greatest thing ever as it was promised to be. And in the last few years, the money has really disappeared from the market. Um, so we're in a very different place where we were a couple of years ago. So the reality of the, the situation at the moment, um, there, there's two kind of major hardware skews. You've got the full VR headsets like uh, HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, and the Microsoft Mixed Reality sets. And these are PC headsets where Everything runs in real time. Everything's driven by a powerful PC. And uh, you can move freely in the space. You can move your head. You can, uh, and so on. This Gar Gargo covered this very well earlier. And then the second kind of headset is the mobile headsets. Um, we're talking about the Gear VR, where you slot your mobile phone into the headset. And there's a number of new ones about to hit the market, like the Oculus Go, which are essentially mobile-driven um, headsets. And the two, uh, the two pieces of uh, reality there is that mobile headsets massively outsell the PC headsets. Um, 
a year, I think over just a year and a half ago, the total number of PC headsets in the world was only about a million. Uh, I think it's gone up to two to three million now, but it's been very slow due to the cost and the hardware requirements. Uh, there's been very slow adoption. Mobile headsets, on the other hand, thanks to things like Google Cardboard and the Daydream and the Gear VR, which are very cheap and accessible to anyone with a mobile phone, they massively outsell the PC headsets. I think it's, I've said 10 to 1. It, I think that's conservative. I think it could be 20 to 1. And the reality of the mobile headsets is that because the mobile is so slow and because the resolution is so high, the, the quality of the experience is low and much of it is reliant on video. So whether we love or hate 360 uh, mono or stereo video, it's a very big part of many uh, mobile VR experiences at the moment. And it's not going to go away for a while. If anything, it's getting worse because of all the new uh, standalone headsets. But we're definitely in a different place than we were a few years ago uh, business-wise. So my feeling is at the moment that you don't have to look too far on the VR stores to realize that much of the content is not very good. Um, we're kind of in an early iPhone app store situation here where there's, there is a few very good games where there's obviously been some money invested from certain sources to make them a really good VR experience. And then there's a few games that are making money, like decent indie games that are making money. And then there's an awful lot of um, noise and sort of very low quality, particularly outside of the game sector. Um, there's a lack of content. Uh, most of it, even, if, even the stuff that's not games, tends to look like games. So you've got a lot of sort of game-like ex interactive experiences, even if they're not calling themselves games directly. And most of the stuff on the VR stores, on the real-time stores, is made in Unity or Unreal. Uh, and that gives you a look. It gives you a certain look, and everything kind of looks the same or very similar. Because of, the, because of the massive hardware demands, the performance demands, a lot of the interesting visual stuff is just not really achievable for most people. So uh, there's a lot of very similar looking aesthetics out there, a lot of flat shaded polygons and lines. But then the VR 360 video situation is, uh, is quite different. So the problem with VR video, with rendering video, is the massive size of the videos you end up having to put out. If, you, if you're rendering at 4K, then that's four times, we're talking not four times the size of an HD video, but eight times, because they're doing 4K by 4K for stereo. And to actually get a good looking 360 video you need to, in stereo, you need to be going to 8K by 8K. And this, is, this multiplies the number of render, the, the render time by, we're talking like 32 times as big as a normal video, 64 times, it's enormous. And this enormous render time jump makes it incredibly difficult to work with the traditional tools. And then you've got the problem that, you know, you can to some degree preview work on a 2D screen, but to work in VR, you need to be working in the headset. And if your render times are this long already, you're not going to be able to work interactively very easily at all. I think there are some plugins that get you some of the way there with some effects, but you're playing a guessing game all the time when working on content. And the guesses have to take a very long time to get proof whether they were right or not. So it's a very painful experience. So you, on one hand, you've got real-time stuff is really tough to do. VR video is really tough to do. So we kind of thought to ourselves, there must be an opportunity for us. We thought, OK, Notch is surely a great thing for VR. Because it's a real-time workflow, so you can design in real time. You can edit and preview in the headset, without, and you can render 360 really fast. Like We can render 360 video in stereo in real time, so we're actually able to real-time preview it. And we, because we're all, we have this nice node-based interface, we don't need anyone to be able to code. We hope it opens up the VR content creation market outside of the typical like, games engine-only stuff. And well, that's what we thought. So uh, 
an opportunity came up to make a VR music video uh, for a Finnish band called Phantom. So um, Phantom is a Phantom is a um, they're a Finnish duo. Uh, they're they're not like they're not massive, but they're reasonably known in some sectors. And um, some of their music videos have, have been quite innovative. They've used uh, like they they had a video which was entirely shot on Connect. It was quite well received. Um, so they approached us about doing a music video. Um, and we decided to try and do that in VR. But the goal was to do a multi-format release. So it would be released as a real-time video for Oculus, um, a 360 VR video for YouTube, and also a 2D video. So we wanted to provide three experiences. And we wanted to make something that was a linear, narrative-driven experience with some interactivity but not a game, not driven by the interactivity. The interactivity is part of it. You're able to, you're able to conduct, but you're not, you, you don't have to do something to progress. So we thought hey, that's actually a reasonable template for demos. Like This is kind of a demo in, um, in VR. And it also gave us an opportunity to really test the whole process and the Oculus submission process. So here's a video. Um, I'm not running this with audio. I'm also not running this in VR because, as we, as we know, like VR demos are always horrible. You could watch me enjoy my own video, or you could just look at the 2D version on screen. So um, the experience is that you ha you are able to interact with the particles using the Oculus Touch controller. You're kind of able to conduct the visual. Um, you see it in the headset, uh, but the thing is, a fixed duration. It's about five, six minutes long. Uh, it follows the lyrics and the narrative. Um, so it is very much a, a music video, but with some interaction and designed from the start for VR. So this led to certain uh, considerations, obviously. So first and foremost, it has to work as a music video, not just as a VR experience. It has to actually be a music video. Uh, so this means, obviously, there's a, there's a track you have to you lay the track down. You make some visuals that fit the track. That's the that's the core goal. And the visual has to support the audio. Uh, we actually use the audio to drive the uh, visual effects, so it feels very in sync. But we also because it's a music video, we wanted to actually see the band. Like we didn't just want to have um, some motion gra graphics and some lyrics. We wanted to actually put the band in there and make a real um, make a music video. So, um, but obviously in 2D, that doesn't necessarily translate that well to VR if you've just got a flat 2D shoot. So we used uh, Connect and uh, digital SLRs, and we did a little uh, shoot. So we shot the band uh, in green screen with the Connect as well. So we used the Connect to generate the depth map, and then we used the DSLR to generate the color, map them together, and this gives us this kind of... Um, like this 3D volumetric capture on the cheap. You can spend an awful lot of money doing this very well, or you can get a Kinect camera and do it very cheaply. And given the size they were on screen, I think it got away with it quite well. So yeah, this, this enabled us to give, have some depth. So you can kind of, you know, when you look around, they're not just flat in space, there's actually some, some realism there. So now let's talk about how how VR actually shaped the experience. So the first and most fundamental decision about, um, about the video was what the format was going to be, what we were going to release it on. And the format, you, the headset you support or target completely defines a lot of things about the experience. If, you're, you, if you design for the HTC Vive, the way the HTC Vive is set up is a free roaming kind of headset. You put the headset on and you can walk around. So an experience is naturally has to be designed as something that you can walk around. Whereas when you're, uh, when you're using an Oculus Rift, the average person in an Oculus Rift, they sit like this at their desk with their Rift on, and they're looking forward the whole time. And so everybody, when they, when they put the headset on for the first time and they start the video, everybody does this, and they look around. And then they realize that they're sat on a chair and it's deeply uncomfortable looking like this all the time. So they give up, and they just look forward for the rest of the experience. And that 
kind of it gives you this very uh, important design cue. Just by limiting it to a certain headset, you've instantly solved a certain degree of the problems. Um, and 360, uh, the, the 360 video thing, the, the mobile headset thing, it's a, similar, it's a similar thing, although because there's no wires, people are less tethered, so they are more likely to look around. But I think the, um, by, by choosing to go with the Oculus, Firstly, it gave us an experience that we knew we could relatively do as front-focused. And secondly, uh, we knew that the, three, the Oculus experience would translate quite well to 2D and to 360. Because if, if someone is sat at a desk looking around, it's not that dissimilar to being sat with a mobile looking around a video. So it kind of made that transition easy. If you'd made something for Vive, I think it would be quite a stretched port. Um, so, the next consideration is um, interactivity and focus. So, because we chose to make it forward focused, uh, we knew that we could just stick most of the content in front of the viewer and get away with it just fine. We knew that the user would look around, so there needed to be something ar around them, but we knew that we could put the content in front. And we also, so we made it interactive, uh, firstly through the touch controllers, so you can conduct the particles in space. But we also use the um, a very common mechanic, uh, particularly on the Rift, which is the, the look at mechanic. So it uses gaze, uh, ray casting, and that can hit stuff, and that used to um, create or affect the visual. And that can, that can work regardless, because the problem with the touch at the moment on the Oculus is that most users, or not all users, have the touch controllers. So you have to design for both, irritatingly enough. So because, again, because it's a music video, the track follows a certain arc, and the narrative follows a certain arc. At the beginning of the track, it's very quiet and very gentle. People naturally start messing around with the controllers and trying to create effects. But as the video goes on and the track warms up and the visuals start appearing, they stop. Most of them stop, work, stop interacting and they just watch. And it becomes more of a passive experience. And that is totally by intention and by design. So it enables us to kind of be aware that we don't have to make content everywhere. We can focus it forward and we can get away with it. So um, I think actually Garg covered this in a lot more detail and better than I did, but uh, nat naturally with VR, certain things don't work. You have to think in 3D. Uh, the 2D tricks that we use are common uh, in motion graphics just don't work. Uh, and then you also need to be aware of things like stereo consistency. So your particles, for example, if you're making them flat to screen, they, they have to point the same way in the left and right eye. You can't have things that start uh, messing up in the left and right eye. Reflections have to be done from uh, the correct eye position so that they appear in stereo in the left and right eye correctly and they don't go weird. Um, the VR 360 video brings its own challenges. So stereo separation, the way that it works with um, the 360 stereo video is you render from two points of view and you shift the, the right point offset from the left point, and that gives you the stereo effect. But that, separa that separation is something that you have to choose to get the, what's something that looks right. And this requires a lot of fiddling and messing about in order to actually get the right visual result. Because if you get it wrong, it's either very flat or very uncomfortable. It's, uh, there's definitely some... Um, tuning there, but thankfully we could do it in real time, so at least we could look at it and fiddle with it until it felt good. So here's an example of some content that uh, is the gears piece from uh, the, the wind tunnel thing from earlier. And this is how it would typically look when we're designing for a 2D frame. So you can see we've got a ton of post effects, we've got this nice wide angle aspect, uh, we've got some stretching effects on the bottom, depth of field, all kinds of things. And yeah, there's loads of tricks to make a simple scene look nice. So when we translate this to VR, we lose all the control over the aspect, we lose all the post effects, uh, we lose all the, the edge stretching and everything, and we get something much more plain. Um, already a lot of the magic of the scene has been uh, lost in space. 
And then when we actually see when we look around, there's nothing there. So you have to actually fill that out, which is very painful. Not to mention that the volumetric rays would probably be too slow in VR as well. So generally, it adds its set of challenges. Something that was actually a bigger consideration in many ways is how you edit in VR, how you actually work on content in VR. So the typical cycle of edit, editing a piece of content is you make some changes, and then you play it, and you see what it looks like. But the problem now is to preview it, you've got to put your headset on. And to edit it, you've got to take, take your headset off. So you've taken a quite quick preview edit cycle, and now it's become do some edits, put the headset on, adjust the headset, make it feel comfortable, set your vision right, press play, take the headset off again. And this is incredibly annoying. It messes up your hair. It's not particularly, um, it makes the whole process much more painful. So anything we could do to reduce the number of times you had to take on and off your headset was the biggest win we could do for editing. So we looked at various options for in VR UIs. And some of the game engines are using these touch-based UIs. There's uh, some painting programs. We've we're still experimenting with them, but we found that for tight control, like moving a keyframe, moving a node, it's quite annoying using the touch controllers. So we went for something really simple and ghetto where we just uh, mirrored the main UI, the window UI, into the headset on a curved plane and enabled you to continue to interact with it with your mouse and keyboard. And most people don't need to see the keyboards to use the keyboard anymore. So uh, this actually worked pretty well. It meant that you could do a lot of editing with the headset on. Uh, so we discovered as well that VR has a lot of use as a design tool. As a way for visualizing scenes, you get a great sense of scale that often you end up guessing at when you're designing in 2D. When you put your headset on and you view the scene in 3D, even if the scene's not designed for VR, you get this very immediate sense of whether the scale feels good. So we started using it for even for non-VR projects, just to visualize in previous scenes. We regularly use it. It's become a very useful tool. So um, the next thing to discuss is the Oculus submission process. So we, once we made the experience and everything was going well, we submitted to Oculus. And because uh, we wanted to get it on the store, obviously. And so Oculus has a submission process where first there's a series of technical checks, as you might imagine. These test things like whether you display the right error messages, whether it pauses when you take the headset off, whether you're using the right audio device, all the really boring things like that. But then they, and they check your menu interactions and everything as well. But then the main thing they check is whether it runs at 90 fully. So if you were making a, something where you weren't going to put it on the store, you might accept a few, um, a few drops in frame rate. But when you're submitting to Oculus, they don't. So it has to run solid 90 all the time. And you can imagine that this is actually kind of a pain because you're dealing with a very high pixel count. You're dealing with like you know, a couple of times higher than the normal pixel count if you're rendering to 1080 HD. And then you've got to render two eyes as well. And then you've got to do it at 90 rather than, say, 30, which is normally acceptable. So you end up having to render 10 times as fast as you would on a normal PC demo or PC game. This is probably why the content, there's so many content issues on VR, because the, frame, the, the headroom is just not there. So um, it's painful. And the thing was that they was, it's, there's, no, uh, there's no drops allowed. They were measure it. They use a tool to measure if there are any frame drops. And if there are any frame drops, they fail you. So this was a process that we went through for a couple of months, I think, in the end, where we were going backwards and forwards trying to achieve uh, the 90 uh, FPS limit. And so we did quite a lot of stuff. Um, so, excuse me, this is my one like codery uh, slide. So,
So the main problems with VR are the high res and having to render everything twice. So the, the rendering everything twice issue, we had a lot of things that were being done in vertex shaders or in geometry shaders, and we took most of it out and did it all in compute once, so, when we, so we could render something twice, um, just we're using uh, compute shaders as a front end. So it cached everything once and then re-rendered it twice. Um, we added a lot of culling, a lot of uh, stuff into compute to cull particles, to cull clones, to generate the geometry in the compute rather than the vertex shader and so on. Uh, we had to kill most of the post effects. Uh, they, um, they don't often work anyway. And we did some staggering of stuff over frames. And we switched to forward rendering. In practice, we didn't really need any shadows or anything anyway, so we were able to get away with it. But it was quite challenging, and we still didn't get there. So we were probably running quite some way off 90 still. Um, the average FPS was good, but it kept spiking at certain points in the, in the thing. Like, at some point, too much comes on. Yeah, the, I mean, it was, always, it was always these little spikes. So, and it's not about the average, it's about the worst case. So, um, yeah, we were really struggling and we kept continually failing the uh, submission. So one day we thought, okay, what if we just add something where we resize the frame buffer based on the frame rate? So it gets lower res as it gets slower and that boosts it back to get faster again. So we did that and it actually worked. This helped completely smooth out the... Um, the frame rate, and now the we so the, the, at the slow points on the slow GPU because remember this is a GeForce 970 which is pretty old at this point. This is like you know, a quarter the speed of the, the GPUs we're using in our computers. Um, this got this got us through the uh, most of the problems. However, we were still failing. We were still failing submission. So then we thought to ourselves, like, hang on, how many 970s are there in the wild right now? Like probably most people have a better or more, more modern GPU. So how many people are actually going to be watching this on a 970? Probably only the people at Oculus who are doing the test. So we thought to ourselves, hang on, so if we detected the 970 GPU and then just like cut a load of stuff out and t turned it all down, like sort of uh, like you know, Volkswagen when they're doing the emission tests, they detect they're in the emission test and just cheat. And we thought, okay, if we do that, what are the chances of this working? And uh, so we did it. And then I told Gaga about it, and he did it, and they started passing straight away. So, uh, so, so we did it as well. <laughs> yeah. What was that? AMD. Yeah, they never ran AMD. I'm certain they never ran AMD. And then, so we did it, and, and it started working. So we, we started passing, and then it was all good. But yeah, it worked. And if anyone else wants to use that trick, I imagine it will work for you as well. So um, what were the aftermath of this? So the aftermath of this was very good. We released this in January, and in the first two weeks, we got 12,000 downloads and installs on the Oculus Rift. Now, I want to put that in context. So there's probably about a million Oculus Rifts in the wild, I reckon. So... That's more than 1% of the total install base of the Oculus Rift. Uh, we got good reviews and we got good press. But also to put this in context, so Sokia, the demo that we released at Assembly this year, that got around three to 4,000 binary downloads to date. So we got three times as many downloads uh, for the binary on Oculus as we did for a PC demo that was a lot more well-known and got a lot more YouTube views. So if you're talking about just getting people to watch your, your real-time thing, that then, then VR has been an outright success. We've got much more real-time views than we would have done before. But to view it another way, the band, their last two music videos that they've released on YouTube, their view, they got around 3,000 views, I think, for their videos. So you could also argue that if you're making, if you're a smaller band, if you're an indie band, then putting something out on VR is actually a very good way to get noticed, to get views. But furthermore, like VR as a platform for music videos is fantastic. 
The problem these days is that people generally don't sit and listen to a piece of music. They, in the old days, you, know, you would sit in your bedroom and you'd put your headphones on and you would listen to an album back to you know, start to end. Nowadays, everybody listens to music through streaming platforms, through YouTube, uh, in ways that they're constantly distracted, often on their phone, often while on Facebook, often while watching a cat video, or doing all these things at once. That means that they don't really listen to the music, they're, or they half listen, or they listen to one song and then they go and do something else, or they listen to the song for 30 seconds and then they go and walk away, or they click on to the next thing. The thing with all of these 12K downloads and views of this video is that you're pretty sure that they all experienced the entire track from start to finish, and they were all solely focused on that track. They had no distractions. There was no notifications from Facebook coming up in their VR headset, although I'm sure that will get added at some point in the future. So you're talking about, actually, for, for the artist, for the music artist, you could argue that a VR video has given them a lot of views, it's generated the interest, and it's made people actually listen to their music and experience their music, and probably in a much more engaged way than most of the times they listen to their music. So it's a great, it's a great tool. Additionally, like the VR, so Oculus, Oculus themselves were very positive about this, about this piece being released because they fully recognize that they want to get more non-games material onto the VR stores because they want to widen the user base beyond simple like gamers and you know, the curious, the, the sort of VR curious. They want to widen it out into a mass market medium. And part of that, a big part of that is non-games content. So they were very receptive to it. And they were, I think there's a big opportunity here for doing more of this kind of piece, more interesting content that's not games. The VR, VR music videos definitely has potential. So what is the point? What was the point of doing all of this, um, of doing all of this uh, stuff in the first place? Is it worth it? So VR is still at an early stage. It still has its problems. You could argue that the first generation headsets were not very particularly good. They were hard to install, they were hard to use, they're uncomfortable, etc. Uh, there is a low install base at the moment. There's only around a million headsets. You could argue that these are major negatives of VR, when we, particularly when we're talking about uh, people like us, like the community of game devs, of indies, of uh, people making demos in particular, people making creative projects. You can argue that these things make it unattractive as a medium. I argue the opposite. I think it actually makes it more attractive as a medium. This low install base means that there is a lack of projects because people aren't making money out of their projects. It means that there's a lack of big AAA titles coming in and like completely taking over and taking all the attention. There's actually a lot of room for interesting creative stuff and non-game content, and it will stand out, and it will get watched. You know, this video shows that a piece of non-game content made for a band that doesn't have a particularly massive uh, PR reach will still get a lot of views. So it's an opportunity. If you want to make a demo for VR, chances are it will get seen, and it will bring, bring your stuff to a new audience, an interested audience. So, I want to quickly talk about the ways in which VR is currently being used in the live events world. Uh, so the first way that VR was adopted very quickly was for pre-visualization. So uh, it's a great tool when you're building a stage, uh, when you're designing a stage and you want to show the artist what their stage is going to look like, or you want to show them what the lights are going to look like. Uh, a VR is a great tool for that. You can put someone in the space and they can walk around it and they can understand that having, uh, having that uh, camera tower there will actually mean that 5,000 people can't see properly, or it'll mean that you know, the screen's obviously far too small for the people at the back to see, or it, it enables you to visualize the space in a very direct, obvious way. So it's super handy. However, the, the next way it's been used, so 
we say VR isn't making money when we talk about consumer VR, but there is a, a, there is a sector where VR actually is making money, and that is uh, physical installations, like on-site installations. So uh, there's a thing like the Star Wars Void thing that's currently running, a VR Star Wars experience. There's been a number of other physical experiences where you go to a location, you pay some money, and you put on your headset, and you have an experience that also includes some physical elements, um, live actors, potentially, a whole range of things. And these are making money. Uh, so there is movement and there is activity in the VR world, just not for the end consumer market, necessarily. However, in time, we are going to see more VR projects that do reach the end consumer. So we're going to see more VR music videos and like home VR experiences. And the ultimate, the, obviously the future goal is people want to, like, definitely there's company interest, there are companies who are very interested in doing live streaming of VR, of, of concerts to VR. And they, they clip, you know, selling VR tickets and you can go and watch your thing at home through a headset. And all of these things are being worked out. There's been discussion about how this is a solitary experience, where there are people working on ways to uh, enable multiple people to share the same experience in one space, for example. So all of these things are being considered. I think we will see movement over time. I think it's only is going to continue to grow. And finally, I want to talk about VR demos. So my argument is I think VR could be a great platform for demos for a number of reasons. Firstly, the same things that make it good for music apply for demos. You've got to watch it in real time. How many people actually watch demos real time anymore? How many people watch demos on their phone on YouTube on some shitty like 4G connection that means it looks really low res and horrible and it's probably out of sync? At least with VR demos, people are actually watching those live, in real time, for real, at the way they're meant to be seen. And just like with music, the, the fact that you're locked in, that you're not distracted, there's no phone and no Facebook and no distractions, you actually watch the demo and you actually get into the demo. It's very powerful. It's what every demo maker actually wants from their audience is for them to sit and watch the demo and concentrate on it. And VR gives you that in a way that other mediums don't. So, so that's from the, from, the, from the viewer experience, if it's, if it's good. The, um, the other way of looking at it is from a, a more like commercial angle, I guess. So VR at the moment is desperate for interesting content that's not games, and particular stuff that's not made in you know, the same game engines with the same aesthetic. Like interesting stuff released on VR gets watched because they, they want to see more interesting stuff. There's an opportunity here. There's, a, there's an audience waiting who badly want to watch demos in VR, whether they know it or not. And if you put them in front of them, they'll watch it. So this provides an interesting argument. You, the scene that we all love has been in decline in numbers for a while. And, and yet, at the same time, more people are coding creatively than ever. More people are interested in graphics than ever. More people are doing creative stuff with computers than ever. But they're not necessarily coming into the demo scene. And not in the way that they were in the 90s or something, when really the major outlet for creativity on the computer was the demo scene. That's no longer true. VR gives the demo scene an opportunity to reach new audiences and, be, and interest them and in a very level playing field with everything else on the platform. We're not when you talk about uh, real-time graphics nowadays competing against games, we all have the fear of like massive AAA games that look amazing and have 300 artists, and we feel inferior because we're unable to compete. And we go off and do uh, like a 1K instead, knowing that no one else is going to do it. Whereas when we talk about VR, the, level, the playing field is much more level. There aren't these huge studios making pieces of VR content. You can make a demo, and your demo team is going to be as big as the guys making you know, the team's making a lot of the stuff on the VR store. You can compete, you can make something cool, and people will want to watch it. There are some things to overcome. Like, obviously, the, uh, the idea of a, a demo compo in VR is going to be uh, a challenging one. But in, not every demo has to be watched in a compo. 
maybe there's an opportunity for multi-format releases. I don't know. But personally, I think there's a great opportunity here for, for um, a future in VR demos, if we're willing to pursue it. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Any questions, or are we, are we short on time? <coughs> Do you have any concerns about the eyesight? About eyesight? Um, I haven't really thought about it, to be honest. <laughs> is, it, is that a problem, or...? Uh, I mean, the, may, the, the only times that VR really irritates my eyes are when I don't put the headset on properly and I'm watching it out of focus. I think if you're careful to actually focus the, um, the headset, it's pretty good. High resolution, high frame rate. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you're, you're basically screens taped to your head, right? Yeah. They're, yeah, exactly. You're working your, um, you are probably working your uh, eye muscles, aren't you, in, as you look around. I guess this is probably something that we're going to discover in about 20 years when they've done uh, full research on the effect of VR on eyesight. But for now, we're just uh, guessing, I think. Yeah. What's that, sorry? Uh, yeah, Sokia was made with Notch. Um, Instant God was made with Notch. Ziphead was made with Notch. What? <laughs> sorry? <laughs> what? <laughs> Was? <laughs> sorry, the line's breaking up. I can't hear you. <laughs> it would mean that you're on um, 360 video. Um, maybe, maybe there's room for a like a 360 animation compo, and that would be how that would work, I guess. Because the Google Cardboard is not going to be able to run unless you're talking about a mobile. Mobile only, but it would be interesting to see a, like a like a you know 360 video compo at some point. Why not? Yeah. Does it work? Okay. Um, what about just streaming stereo video to a headset? Yeah. Um, I mean, so you need to stream 4K. Um, with a fast, with a good enough network, you could probably stream 4K. Could you stream it to a room full of mobiles, though? I don't know if you could. Maybe you'd have to have like a Wi-Fi hotspot under every seat, and then it would work. I don't know. I think it, I think the size is such an issue. I think it's a challenge. Yeah. How many of you developing Notch? Is it just you or you basically run a company with like hundreds of developers? Um, we have three developers now. Um, I, still, I still do code quite a lot, but there's three of us. Uh, one of the others is uh, Fizzer, who you might be aware of, who's um, released a lot of very good 4K intros. So he's one of our developers. So we're slowly, demo scene is taking over the world slowly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, like distance between something like processing and uh, notch in terms of how you use the, like code versus 
node-based mm -hmm. editors and everything. Yeah. So do you see some space for like creative coders to start experimenting with VR and wrapping it in a friendly way so that they don't have to deal with all these like crazy SDKs and C++ and so on? I mean, I, I would be really surprised if no one had worked on any processing VR path. It seems quite obvious to do it, but yeah. But, well, but you can do web VR, right? You can do web VR with WebGL, and uh, yeah, it's, that is completely open to you. Yeah, I've, I've heard it worked once. No, but yeah, they, they, I think there, I think there are a number of there are a number of opportunities, and people are trying stuff. Absolutely. I think we are all done. Great.